Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. (laughs) Sam and Helly. Big Sam. Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Oh, that was terrible. That was, that was horrible. horrible. That was horrible. <laughs> hey, this is Big Sam Helly. You're listening to the Break It Down Show. That's all you got to do. Hey, this is Sam Helly. Listen yep. to the Break It Down Show. Hey, this is Sam Helly, Big Sam, and you are listening to Break It Down Show. Yes, we're at the Husing Dojo off in the office. Yes. Scott's sitting here, and uh, actually, we've got Phil in the house, too, so he may chime in. We've got a brand new American, but also a birthday boy sitting with us. And this is fantastic. You you were from Iraq. Yes, sir. I and was... you, we're going to have you talk in a second. Let me introduce who you are. You were an interpreter in Scott's unit, and you also, turns out you and I worked in the same area and clearly in the same units. So we've all worked a lot of the same ground, and that's super fantastic to have you in here. I love when I get to meet brand new Americans. It's my favorite thing. That's what makes this country great is people want to come here and build something big. So I, I'm, you're a big Sam, and I love that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you for having us here, and thank you, my fellow American. That sounds good. That never gets old hearing that. Yeah. It's, it really is like a super American success story, and we were just kind of busting Sam's balls before the show <laughs> and telling Phil a little bit about, about Sam and how he was – probably 40 pounds less he was an 18 year old skinny iraqi who'd risked everything to join the coalition and help us speak the language that's how we got introduced back in 2006 2007 uh when our company fought in iraq as we moved around and since then it's the rest the rest is history uh but you you tell the story about how how you made it over here to america how that whole process worked I applied for a special immigrant visa. It's a program for people who work on the behalf of the United States government in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, uh, of course, I went through the background check and all, and it took me about a year and a half with help uh, from Major Asmussen, Bam Bam, and a U.S. congressman that helped me move to the U.S. in 2012. And the reason why I moved to the U.S. is working for the American troops for three years they really didn't put me in a safe position. I got threatened a few times. Uh, people calling me traitor, disloyal for working with Americans. And I just, I picked up a lot of things from working with Americans, uh, work ethics, the, I wanted to change my life. And then that's why I decided to move to the U.S. And I moved to the U.S. in 2012 and uh, last June, I became American citizen. That's an incredible story. And I want to ask you, well, one, let me set the stage a little bit for the audience because they don't understand what it means to be who you were. Where I was up in Missoula in particular, it got really bad in 2004, post-elections especially bad, where there would be Iraqis in a ditch with no head all, all the time. If they could identify that you worked with the Americans, if you weren't part of the group, you were going to lose your head, at least get your neck cut open. And quite possibly and probably people in your family would get what what called night letters. And a night letter basically is quit doing what you're doing or we're going to come kill you and your family. That's one thing here in America where you might get that and you're like, ah, they're just blowing the steam. But where you're at, people actually getting killed. In my case, the reason is why I actually started working interpreter back in 2006 during the Civil War when it started in Iraq, we got a letter from a terrorist dropped at our gate. And one morning I was going to school and I opened the front gate and I saw that letter and I opened it up and it was saying, infidels, you got 24 hours to leave, otherwise you'll be beheaded. And with that envelope, there was a, a round bullet inside of it. So it was a serious threat. My dad actually didn't believe it because we... He believed in the United Iraq. There is no civil war. It's not going to happen no matter what. 
but we started talking to our other neighbors and uh, they had the same thing and we heard that some people actually got killed so that point we had to leave our house and my dad on other properties in the same neighborhood so we just had to get in the car pick up whatever we can and then we left pretty much everything behind and we thought it's a matter of time a week or two and then we'll be back home but it wasn't it took years and after a few weeks I just couldn't like we lived in big house it used to be called a castle in my neighborhood and then luckily my dad owned apartment building in another neighborhood we moved there and we didn't have furniture we didn't have anything so I couldn't take living and it's having a good life a spoiled life and then have nothing I couldn't watch my dad struggling my sister struggling and I I talked with my friend and my friend he advised that we both he had the same thing he, his family got displaced and he advised like let's work for the Americans you know we the Americans have the same enemy that we have which is Al-Qaeda the terrorists want to clean up our country and to me it sounded like a good idea you know revenge yeah like it's a bad thing but at that time it made sense to me and at the same time I can make some money help my family and help my country clean it up from the terrorists because this is my country and this is the only solution is to bring it back as it should be in a good condition and the only way is to get back to our houses is get rid of the terrorists it wasn't the Americans the Americans are not the ones who lived in my house it was Al-Qaeda it was the terrorists who loved that note and we got displaced because of them and so that's when uh, I talked with my dad that I actually I signed up without telling every, anyone in my family I signed up with American company as a contractor and uh, two days they gave me two days they were like hey you have two days and you should come to IZ in international zone and then you will fly out to Camp Al Assad in west of Iraq and so I had only two days and I didn't I haven't told anybody yeah. okay, no family n not my mom dad nobody except my friend he knows about it and he we had to tell somebody so I broke it down to my dad and I like I still remember that moment I would never ever forget it like happened yesterday to me I was driving and my dad was sitting in the passenger seat and I just told him like that listen I I'm gonna work as interpreter with the Americans and I'm leaving day after tomorrow and I signed a contract and I'm leaving my dad he thought that I was just talking crazy like I wasn't serious I was just pissed about the terrorists and all and he was like you sure what, what are you talking about because I have some other family relatives who did the same thing a year before 2006 and 2005 they were kidnapped raped and murdered yeah, for that, being that, you know we got to put that in perspective yeah. too is you know for any listeners that think that and many have tuned into the show before and heard other uh, terps that have been on the show and that's what we called sam and other other guys were terps that was the nickname we called uh most of the interpreters but this is not urban legend that we're talking about this is what happened this is daily life and i think the only way that the average American or, or listener to this program can really relate that is some sort of gangland activity where there's a really heavy criminal element. And to be an interpreter embedded with the U.S. forces would be is tantamount to as dangerous as being an undercover DEA agent or an undercover cop and you get exposed and they find out where you live and they come and you're, you're done. I, I mean, it was literally that dangerous for these guys and when we're, we're not talking about federal agents that go through uh, you know fletzy in, in glencoe georgia or, a, or an academy we're talking to this kid that i that i again knew as an 18 year old kid yeah who was trying to get his education he was in college already and he sacrificed all that because he took up the cause our cause in his own to really 
do whatever he could to regain some sort of civility and respect that his family had earned for his whole life. And, and all of that was wiped away. And so it's really, it, it's really important that listeners understand is this is, this is not something guys sit around and we haven't been drinking tonight and we're not <laughs> exaggerating the facts. This is, uh, it, and all of these things are events that we witness firsthand day in and day out over this long war, both in That's Iraq and the same things were happening in Afghanistan for, for the Terps that served over there. Yeah, the thing, if you're to understand what it is to be Sam's family, you guys have some money, you have some security. Now, if that stuff was gone, if your dad was a simpler guy who's a farmer or something like that, you really have to go find some family that lives far away or you're going to move to Syria. So whatever your life is now, whatever money you have coming in, that's all gone. And you can choose to stay, but I'm here to tell you, I've talked to a lot of families too, and there's always one burned out home in the town. That sends the message for everybody else who thinks, oh, we're just going to stick this out. Like, no, you're not. Your whole life has changed. And a lot, of, a lot of the dads got killed. So now you have a society that has to have men. And because if not, the women, frankly, are whores. You know, like the, the wife of the husband that's dead, she's got to now go live with that guy's brother. And he may not have the ability to take care of that family. So Sam's fortunate to have a family that he could go to a dad and say, here's what I want to do. Her families are even worse off than that. So you decide to make this decision to go and sign up, do the contract, and you, in effect, are going to be in a military unit going out on patrols every day. I mean, you don't know. Again, maybe, with zero training. Zero training, Zero right. training. And yeah. really zero gear. Did you know you were going to have any gear or anything? Or like, I got these tan trousers and this uh, nice blazer. I'm going to sit in the office somewhere. And- yeah, what did you show up in? I mean, like, when we joined the military, we all show up in, like, khaki slacks and, like, a collared shirt. And then they make you throw it in a cardboard box. What did you show up with when... When you left that day, before you got on the Blackhawk out of like uh, LZ Washington or wherever they flew I, out of, I still remember what I exactly was wearing. I was wearing a sweater and a jeans, and oh, like training shoes too. And they like w- when we got to Camp Al Assad, they were like, "What are you wearing?" We are, <laughs> they were sending me to Haditha for an assignment. Who's this dork? <laughs> yeah, like, like what are you wearing? <laughs> you gotta shave your beard. You gotta have. You have to look like us. And they literally gave me like like the flag jacket and the boots and the helmet. I didn't know how to use. It. I didn't know how to put it Could on. Did you even grow a beard back then? I mean, you were like just barely. Oh, it's it just a few hair. It's yeah. not like cool <laughs> like my. Beard now he's right got now. like this yeah. uber sexy <laughs> GQ esque, and he pride. You know, I'll throw Sam under the bus a little bit because we've known each other for a long time. But he does pride himself on, as he told me earlier, super photogenic, yeah. and uh, he's done some minor modeling stuff. I think on the side that he like won't the, admit to. Yeah. So, but. Uh, yeah, it's he's grown into his own element for sure. You're like the Arab Burt Reynolds, the young Burt Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take the Arab. Have Reynolds. you seen the American movie Smokey and the Bandit? I don't think so. Yeah, no. it's a glad we got to get you oh, locked onto that, that one. So that what was so Pete? You talked about the the draw. Like, what was the money like in comparison? Uh, so the contract company, which you don't have to name, there were several of them over there. But um, what was the money like? Was that a, kind of a a draw for you i mean i know your whole story i wrote about it in the book but um there's a whole chapter just about you and ford who was your best friend that you grew up with both who were my terps i think ford was the one that really the tipping point that sucked you back in because you kind of told him to f off you're like yeah i'm not doing this and then he roped you in and i'm sure he said hey they're going to pay us a bunch of money and i don't know what the money was like i think you told me at one point but tell the listeners like what the money was like and then in comparison like what the average iraqi was making well, the salary was a month of salary was about eleven hundred. It depends on what location they send you. Like for the hot zones, Haditha, Ramadi, Fallujah, they give you another two hundred or three hundred dollars. But at the same time, like for like me and Ford and other interpreters, I've never been in the military. I've never held a gun before. And then when I got there, they gave me all this gear, and they were like, "Hey." Let's roll. Let's Good start luck with that. Yeah, let's Good start luck. patrolling. <laughs> and some of the, like your like some companies that I work for, some units they give me guns, and I was like, I don't even know how to use them. And they t- literally told me, this is how you pull the trigger, and this is how you charge it. Just shoot it, point it at the bad guy, not us. Just make sure that you don't point the gun at us. 
So I didn't really have any training, any background training. So it was pretty difficult for me and for the, the, and the other interpreters. The money factor, you know, we're risking our lives. We didn't have any kind of benefits. If we die, like the question that I had and every time we get a gunfight or I get a hit by, we get a hit by IED or I hear a sniper shot was the first question that pops in my head. And the most important question was how my family going to say I died. Are they going to be able to say that I died while I was working with Americans? Are they going to be proud of me? Because they really mm. can't. And the only person who knew what I was doing was my dad. Because I couldn't share it with my mom because, you know, me losing three cousins as interpreters before, it's not going to make my mom, she's going to make her very, very worried about me. So I didn't want to have her that. I didn't want to make her worried about me. So I just told her that I was working in north of Iraq in Soleimania in a pretty safe oil company. Like I'm not working with Americans. Or- so, so similar to the U.S. Marine or soldier who lies to his parents <laughs> about joining the military and says, oh, yeah, I'm going to be an administrative cleric or I'm going to be in Motor T. I won't ever be on the front lines. And they know full well they've signed up for the infantry. Totally lied to mom and dad and kind of sneak off and... But yeah, would, so you're making like 1200 bucks a month. So again, put it in perspective, like wh- what job in America do you make 1200 bucks a month where you would be willing to risk your life, go out, get engaged by an unknown, elusive enemy insurgent force on a daily basis, walking down roads that are laden with improvised explosive devices yeah. and just hang it all out there. I mean, there isn't, there isn't a job like that. Yeah, in a lot of cases, you know, like in a mounted patrol, you're in a bunch of up-armored vehicles, and, and you're relatively safe because you've got big weapons and a whole lot of armor. And they're like, everybody get out, and Sam's one of the guys that gets out. He's you, the first to get yeah. out because without him on on point, true, it, we just couldn't engage with the locals. I mean, that was the immense skill set that he brought to the table. And, and I've told this story many times, but I was what – I like to refer to as a Terp lover. Like, I love the Terps. Like, I loved having them in the unit. I love the capability they brought. And they were in such high demand. Yeah. There just weren't enough Terps to go around. And I'm sure there were other units, and I heard squabble about, oh, the Iraqis, you know, they're trying to embed in the units and gather information and pass it off to, you know, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which I'm sure happened, and there's documented cases that did happen. But for the most part, again, I realized early on that these guys were invaluable. I mean, I'd already been in combat and worked with the Turks on several occasions in deployments. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, and the Marines, too, were, I think they subscribed to that same philosophy as well, and they, tr- they treated them like gold. Yeah, I always defended my interpreters. And you know how it is. All those guys that are negative and, like, Sam has to have his badge out at all times. Well, sometimes Sam doesn't have his fucking badge. Sometimes the badge is turned around. You know, and there's some What's guy a badge? That, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I'm talking on the big camps. But, you know, there'll be some guy that never goes out that's like, who's this guy? And they'll, you know, they'll, you know, give you the business. And I always instructed all of my interpreters to just say yes, ask who they work for, and I'll handle the rest. Because then I would go shake them down. I'd go see the boss over there and be like, don't ever mess with my interpreter. Like, we go out every day. I need that guy straight so we can take care of the guys that are going out. And uh, there's not a lot of people did that because usually there was the other way, like where you would get treated like crap. Did, did you get treated poorly by not the home unit but the other units that were there with you? Well, see, there's two kind of units that you I worked with. There's the unit that was active. They loved interpreters the reason why is because they can build a trust relationship with their interpreter and the reason how they built that trust relationship is because they are active unit they are always in combat they always see action the interpreter with them and they see that the interpreter he's risking his own life he's going the extra mile he's searching with them he's talking with people that the marine or the other guy he doesn't tell him like hey talk to that he just do his work and he do more than his work and he keeps his eye on his team and on himself on everybody he protects everybody when when the unit sees the interpreter like that they will trust him and they will treat him as a king yeah that's what happened with me with echo company to fort with scott unit i was with them all the time i go out four or five times a day and I've never complained, you know, it, it was hot, it was almost 110 degrees, 105, 
with all the gear on three, four times a day. We go each patrol, three, four hours patrol, and the food was terrible. We barely <laughs> get a shower. Yeah. I'm being, yeah, I'm totally. being honest. Yeah, in addition to everything else, like yeah. the, the living conditions, there's no running plumbing. You know, yeah. we're going to the bathroom in a tent with a, a garbage bag that has like kitty litter in it, you know, the wag bag. And it, it was tough. And so, yeah, th- he'd go out on a patrol. And then the patrol would come back. They'd drop him off. He might jam some chow and a couple energy drinks or some water down um, and yeah, you know, dig through the box of halal MREs, yeah. uh, which did not exist. And then the other patrol would probably grab him and take him right back out. So he got no break. So in addition to being constantly exposed, even more so at times in the Marines, uh-huh. he had you know, the fighting, the, the exhaustion, the fatigue. He had to work for me. Yeah. Um, so that in and of itself is added friction. Let's right talk there. about that a little bit. <laughs> no, you say oh, I'm let's out not. For a second, because <laughs> it took me years to learn this. I had a lot of really good interpreters. I was excellent at getting up to speed, but it never occurred to me that when you're remote and really austere, that eating chow is hard for these guys. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm like, okay, we're going every patrol we can. Every patrol, we're going to go out, out, out all the time, and then I'm going to extract everything else out of your head that's not in my notebook and I'm going to work the fuck out of you because I'm here to solve a problem. I never even occurred to me that these guys were tired that they were beat up and needed rest that they needed some good chow because you know how we are. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just like here's the job and I'll be goddamned if I'm not going to go out and help because someone might die if I don't. Were you like similar I mean obviously you're, you're a commander but not always you, you would do other jobs too but how did you handle that stuff? The, the stress and the fatigue, it's, I mean, the human element always has to be factored in. And that's where you do get very focused sometimes, right. almost to a fault. And luckily for me, I had great guys around me. And that was always the secret to my success. I make no bones about it. The sergeants, uh, the lieutenants, even the young, young Marines would always put me in check. And we had a, a great relationship where... They would tell me those things, how the Marines were feeling, how the Terps were feeling, how the combat engineers were feeling, how the dogs were feeling, uh, because we had military working dogs with us. Right. They were always giving me that, that input so I could make a calculated decision. And it wasn't always the decision they wanted, but that's what was needed to accomplish the mission. And Sam was part of that uh, to a large degree because we spent weeks and months on end doing the same thing day in and day out. And after we cleared that sector of the city, in it's like 72 hours or 96 hours i think we cleared the city established firm bases and really stamped it clear and at that point we fell into that routine of daily patrols running 9 10 12 patrols a day within our sector in addition to the other marine units that were around us and it, there was a repetition and a boredom uh, we also lost marines in the city uh, due to sniper fire which was obviously devastating you know psychologically to the marines but also to these you know young iraqis who they don't know where the gunfire comes from all they know is their fellow marines got killed as well and so i never thought about that i never thought how did it affect sam how did it affect ford seeing one of my marines get shot but they were his marines too to this day they all still rally around him and consider them you know one of our own I, i mean to the to the degree where people should know when I retired from the Marine Corps in 2013, Sam and Ford flew out from Chicago when they were living there for my retirement ceremony. That's how connected we, we grew, uh, during the worst times and remain connected to this day. Give the audience an idea. What, how many hours in a day, not a crazy day, just a regular hard Marine day. How many hours are you guys working? We're up 20 hours a day at least. That's, you, you probably slept less than most. Mm-hmm. Three, four hours a day was a luxury. If, and if and you're that. pumping in 100-plus degree heat, tons of gear. And 60 pounds of body armor, ammo, water. And we were foot mobile for the most part pretty much the entire time because our area was pretty, pretty densely populated, and it was very urban. It was all houses. Imagine, like... Any semblance you can think of of like tracked housing where they just build up these massive houses. And that's what it was like in the cities we fought. 
this cinder block landscape that all the houses look the same. You never knew it was coming around any corner. You never knew if they were friendly, if they were enemy. We'd go in, we'd clear houses. And I think I've used this analogy before, but it was like a bad episode of Cops when that show was on <laughs> is if Americans could think you're sleeping at three in the morning and then all of a sudden... <laughs> Marines just rush in yeah. and ransack your house, usher you into another room. They're like, Phil, you and your family, get in there and hunker down. We're going to clear your entire house. And sometimes we'd find weapons. Sometimes we'd find contraband. Sometimes we'd find bad guys. But most of the time, if we did find bad guys, they were sleeping and it was kind of easy to roll them up. They, they were kind of lazy in that regard, I think. Like, they didn't like to fight at night. They wanted to get their sleep. And they took those key moments of opportunity to engage us most most of the time was during the day i think when we fought together when we pushed west um most of the time was daytime engagements but we cleared all night long exactly we owned the night with our technology you know the thermal optics and, and night vision goggles so we patrolled exclusively at night but then once we cleared the city we also did daytime patrols and every time we did daytime patrols we'd normally get shot at (laughs) <laughs> I would. I don't know if it's because Sam was standing next to me. Probably. The radio operator was standing next to me, or they knew who I was, and they're like, that's the guy. But I, the Marines seemed to kind of rally around it and <laughs> bitch and moan a little bit about it. Like, oh, great, the CO is coming out on patrol with us. We are definitely going to get shot at. So yeah. they kind of enjoyed the romance of that. I did not. Um, <laughs> it wore off when I was a young Lance Corporal. So, but What's a hard day, Sam? The hardest day was when you're in a gunfight and you really don't know if you're going to live the next minute. That's, and you know, the cool thing about the Marines, I remember one time, one incident that we were, we were ambushed. It was heavy gunfight and I literally broke down and I was like, I'm going to die. I'm not going to see my parents anymore. I'm not going to see my siblings anymore. And one of the Marines and I was and like, we're, they were like, we were fighting, right? But I, I didn't have a gun. I didn't, I had a pistol with me, but I didn't use it. And he, one of the guys, he looked at me and he was like, hey, if you're going to die, at least you're going to die with a good company here. <laughs> See? Yeah. So he really, <laughs> you know, put a smile on my face. I was like, you know what? You told your guy, you know, yeah. let's, let's kill those mofos. Yeah. Let's get home. You know, let's get back to the base. Yeah. <laughs> so that that yeah. was like the hardest day is, you know, the unknown, unknown thing. Like what what's going to happen? You know, because me, I, I would go like how I'm going to go back home. That's like the most hardest thing for me in my head. How my family going to get me? And what are they going to say? Are they going to say he was working with Americans killing terrorists? Or are they not going to say that because if they say that they're going to put themselves in danger too yeah people will come after and they were like oh those this is our the traitor's family let's go kill them you know that's why i tried i didn't tell like for the whole time for the three years that i worked nobody knew except my dad it's not that i didn't trust my family i trust them with my life of course but people talk people get worried and sometimes it gets to the wrong person people talk and it will get to the wrong person and then it will just put them in danger. So it will be better off if, you know, just keep it quiet. And, it, yeah. You know, I always do a true confession yes. with you. Which of course. Which normally Pete pimps me for. But I will say this. Here's a true confession that I just thought of is that back then fighting under those conditions, I probably did view the interpreters, although they're people, as assets. And I never really took into account until you, you gain a little age and, and wisdom experience that those traumatic events absolutely impacted them. And Sam telling that last story about how he had to think about going back home to his family. What about those pieces of trauma that he accumulated, not just from my company, but the several companies that he worked for during his time as an interpreter in Iraq? How was he going to process those? How did the effects of post-traumatic stress impact those guys? And, I was in Denver doing a book signing and some guy popped up in the back with that very question asking, well, what about all the Iraqis that saw these things and what are we doing to help them with the effects of PTS? And I I had to be quite honest and say, look, 
I'd love to be concerned with them, but I'm really concerned about my own tribe right now and my own military family here in America. But it's absolutely something that probably hasn't been given a lot of thought. And Sam's been back to Iraq since then and could probably speak to that network of people he worked with. They're probably all scattered out right now, but you know, I don't think we've talked much about that. Although Sam has been at events for Save the Brave, he's volunteered at Mud Run uh, to come out and help raise money for veterans of post-traumatic stress. But I think a lot of veterans don't ever think of the assets, the people that worked with us and how that really impacted their lives and still does to this day. I, it'd be probably worth a million bucks for some dude with a PhD in his wall to go back and do a point paper on the number of Iraqis that committed suicide due to the effects of the war. I don't know. Do you have any info on that? I don't really have any specific Do they care about that in Iraq? Do they think, oh, well, just go easy on you know him. He's got post-traumatic stress from the war. We, d- we don't even have... Do you get any benefits or anything? No, not Government at all. Government doesn't give you crap, do they? Nothing. They not tell you to suck it up. Give you a sack of Zoloft or something. <laughs> well... Are you talking about the Iraqi government or the, my government, the U.S. government? Iraqi. Well, oh. well played, well, <laughs> fellow American. Well played. <laughs> Touche. Throw a little French in there. Yeah. The Iraqi government, we don't, like back in Iraq, we don't acknowledge anything that called, that called post-traumatic stress. There's no such Why thing. Why not? And culture, just suck it up. Yeah, just like, culture. It's culturally, it's, yeah. culturally not acceptable to be mentally so, yeah. weak. Yeah. Mental, so, mentally weak people, we've seen how they treat them with, uh, you know, people that suffer from Down syndrome. I mean, we ran into that. Yeah. They're shackled in a oh, basement, boy. literally. We ran into the Marines like, hey, sir, you got to get down here and see this. And we walk down the basement, clear this house, and there's a man in his 30s with Down syndrome, literally with a big link chain and a shackle around his ankle tied to the banister in the basement of this Iraqi home. And that's, that's how they dealt with it. And that's probably the safest Crazy. place for him because if he was anywhere else, he'd probably. Well, they just don't really have set institutions for, for that, yeah. or they, and, they don't. They don't and culturally. They don't. And the the health system in Iraq it's really really bad too. It's, but that's why most people who suffer from that they just talk with each other. They talk with family, and but lately I've like I've been watching on Facebook and on news. There's a lot of people are committing suicide, uh, not only because of the war itself but because of financial situation too and jobs specifically that the unemployment rate in Iraq it's very very high now but here talking about our government here in the US and about the interpreters who worked in Iraq with the American troops what we got here the only thing that we got here pretty much is like here you go. This is a visa, immigration visa to the U.S. This episode Complete of the Breaking five Down years Show in the U.S. And by Lions Rock if you Productions. don't join anything wrong, you won't be a U.S. citizen. And, and that's it. You don't get it. Just we like didn't get any GI, GI Bill or none of that. We, the only thing, you know, so if you're I, I consider social media like the U.S. Marines, uh, like my family. I always tell people that I was born in Baghdad when I grew up with the U.S. Marines. That's, I think There's before that I was a well kid, you know, like my no, dad no gave me the money and I didn't have to do anything. But with the Marines, when I started working with you guys, I really learned a lot of things, you know, about being independent, about looking at things in a different way. And, you know, like when you talk to people or when you see something, you you look at the little things and the details. And then you make a conclusion about that person before you know before you talk to them. So you would actually have an idea. Like I learned a lot of things, and I'm pretty sure if I didn't do any of that, I mean, don't get me wrong. Nobody like going into war. I wouldn't wish that to my worst enemy. But at the same time, it worked for me. And I think because for us as Iraqis, the PTS it's a little bit less than. The American troops, American personnel, when they, when they went to Iraq, is because we were, we are in Iraq. I was born in a war, and I grew up during war and sanctions, and then I was back there the whole time. And and, and then the invasion, two thousand and three. You know, I saw the whole thing. So me, when 
like when we when I started working as an interpreter and we got in a gunfight and I saw bloods and dead bodies. It was it, yeah, it was traumatic. It I kind of like sometimes I think about it deeply, and I when I see myself going, I'm 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 really going deep into it. I I tell myself to stop and think about other things. So I kind of like block it. So it doesn't really affect me because I think because the way that I grew up and the country as a whole, it kind of prepared me when I start working as an interpreter. So that's why in Iraq, Iraqis in general, it doesn't really affect them. So there's two things that were, were kind of interesting that Sam was just talking about was you can relate it to the benefits that obviously they're not American military. They're not Americans at the time, but we have contractors that go over, they work for Triple Canopy or Aegis or Blackwater when they were still in existence, and they have they're covered under these health plans that they sign up and they're making geez, these guys are making like fifteen hundred bucks a day back yeah. in two thousand four when I was in Baghdad before we even met, just exorbitant amounts of money. So it was really worth it for them. They were risking something but they're risking it for the cash reward as contractors and they had those benefits. But again, there's no system even for people like Sam that go through this process, become American citizens legally, by the way. And it was six years to the day from the time he came over to the day that he was sworn in as an American citizen in Tampa. And I know that cause I was there. I flew out yeah. for his uh, swearing in ceremony in Tampa, which is something I'd never done. And I was super proud to be there for him. But that whole process leading up to that, when he was saying the perseverance and things he learned from the, the U.S. military during that time, again, we started the show off with saying, I love to brag on him because it is an American success story, but not only did he, you can tell this story when I hand it back, is how you ultimately graduated college, but he graduates does some more Turpin with other units, then gets his special immigrant visa, comes here, gets his master's degree, gets a, gets his MBA from Roosevelt, gets a degree, gets a certification IT. So he's like this IT guru sitting here with multiple with more degrees than I got hanging on any of my walls here. Computer science masters. Computer, yeah, computer science masters. So uh, you know, he's he knows all about perseverance and and putting in the work. But Sam loves telling the story when we were. At building 500 when he had to come up. tell that part of the story because I know you love telling this I don't tell this story <laughs> uh, yeah and I, when I was working as an interpreter I like during the first year I had to stop going to school because I was going full time and I couldn't take any time off but I grew up in a family who really appreciates education college was like number one thing to my parents although my parents didn't even finish high school so I, I wanted to not disappoint my parents and now myself too. So I spoke with, I, I was talking to some friends in college and they were like, hey, the finals are coming and this is the date for the finals. We can help you with the edu- with the learning material so you can study for it and you can take the exam. And at the same time, while I was working with Echo, uh, Echo Company 2.4 with Scott's unit, uh, we were doing operations and Scott's company, they really, you know, needed the interpreters because they needed to talk to people. The U.S. troops' mission in Iraq wasn't killing people. It was rebuilding the country, talking to people. And the way to do that was through us, through the interpreters. So, But I, at the same time, I needed to go there and because I would lose the whole year if I don't take the final exams. And an Iraq education system is different than here in the U.S. So if I lose... If I don't do the final exams, I'll lose a whole acad- academic year. So I spoke with Scott. I was like, sir. And Ford, at the same time, my friend, he he wanted to do the same thing. But I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. I was like, I will do it. So I went, I went to Scott. I was like, sir, this is the deal. I have exams, final exams on this day. It was like two weeks from the day that I talked to him. And I like I know you really need me here. I know you got an operation here, but I want to go. And if you say no, I would understand. You know. So before that, this does take a lot of balls because you you know how the junior Marines are, young soldiers. They won't come up to the CO and no. just say, "Hey, sir." Terrified. First first question was, "Hey, sir, can I borrow your satellite phone?" So he <laughs> wants to borrow like the only 
satellite phone in the entire company, like my personal satellite phone for emergencies. And I'm thinking, what the hell is he going to do with this phone? Who is he calling? Because even at that point, no one had ever asked me to use my phone, especially one of the Terps. Right. So I'm like, ah, eh, I don't know if this is cool, but I acquiesced. I gave him the phone. He stood right there and made a phone call, you know, back to Baghdad, got, got the 411 on what was going on with the university, his finals. And then he pitches to me and says, I got to bust out of here and go take my finals. Yeah. And then I asked him, I was like, Otherwise, I'll be losing a, a year, you know. And he was like, <laughs> I don't want, I, I don't really remember the exact word, but somewhere between, I don't want a stupid, ignorant mofo works for me. Go do your final exams, pass yeah. it, and come back to me. Yeah, so yeah. He, he, I think he said he was going to be gone like three or four days. And again, I, I said, yeah, I, I want you to get your education, but you're really hamstringing the company because that put us down to one terp for an entire company of over 250 Marines and soldiers. That's that's a lot of workload for Ford. I'm sure he was very happy for you to bail on us for, for almost a week. And I t also told him, I, I, I think something that if he didn't come back, I'd send the Marines to go looking for him if he left us in a exactly. lurch. Because yeah. uh, that... My bi my biggest concern was not his education. I will another true confession on the Break It Down uh -oh, show. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> not his education, although I cared about him deeply. I was more concerned about the mission, which w took priority over everything else. But true to his word, he busted over to Baghdad and then got back uh, later that week. Told me he took all of his exams. I didn't. I don't even think I asked him if he passed or not. Uh, but he I did. Passed. Yeah, yeah, he passed. Yeah, I had an interpreter or two along the way, and they would go to Baghdad University, and I like it always struck struck me as odd. Like, wait, you you don't you, go to school the whole year, but you go finals. Well, that, but also like, there's kids going to school, <laughs> you know, like there's there's Iranians hiding bombs in trees, and you guys are kicking it at the at the student union, and uh, and yeah, same thing. They're like, I I've got to take these tests, and I'm like, why are you still here? You know, like this is your country, you got to invest in it. We need you smart. See ya. Yeah. I had the luxury of doing that because I'm not in command of anything. I'm just you got my little mission and everything. But yeah, it's it's incredible to think about the things you guys had to deal with. Because not only I'm, I'm going to get back to this part, but not only do you have to worry about your safety, you know, and your buddy Ford who talks you into this. You guys are in this together, but also your family safety because if it gets out that you're doing this, if you're working in the same province that you live, if the clothes you wear, like, oh, that guy's Sunni, okay, and then they figure out that you're Jaburi or whatever it's going to be, all of a sudden, like, they can neck down to where you might be and maybe get after you because I've, I've had this happen where the guy wore, like, members-only jackets. is like, only these guys wear members-only jackets. We did get Sam out of his sweater and jeans, though. He showed <laughs> up in, <laughs> like, camis, and he had, you know, flak jacket. I think he wore coveralls most of the time, but... You know, it's interesting about the whole thing. Again, I love giving perspective to listeners is just think about the logistics behind that. So this 18-year-old kid comes up, schedules his whole trip. He's got no car. Yeah. He's got no ride. It wasn't like his brother was outside like, hey, Sam, hop in. I'm going to drive you back to Baghdad, which is like a three-and-a-half-hour drive uh, from the western part of Alambar province to get back. It's yeah. even further than that, isn't it? Yeah. That's you flew life. back, though. I flew back. He flew back on one of the, the rotators. I, again, I wasn't like, hey, how are you getting back? How, when, you know, how are yeah. you going to get there? I didn't like do it. And he's an 18-year-old kid, and he worked out the entire logistics from the firm base, an active combat base right. in the heart of the city. A firm base is, is where Marines are hanging out like in someone's house because they're not on a camp. Right, because we don't plan on staying there for any extended period other than you know, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then we hand it back over. But yeah, so he sorted all that out on his own. And then gets back to the LZ, flies out, gets back to Baghdad, takes a test, makes it back. But, I mean, just to get from the firm base to the the camp where he could catch a helicopter meant he had to talk to one of the, the sergeants and, and say, hey, can I get a ride back? And it's and you guys just have a, to it's be a the significant, It's too. a significant emotional event. I oh, mean, for sure. The other thing I wanted to ask is, okay, so Echo 2-4, Scott's unit, they're like, okay, we're leaving. See you, Big Sam. See you later. You're going to go work for the next company. Like, you're going to be doing the next thing and the next thing. It doesn't ever stop for you, you know? Like, that next day, you could be assigned to a new unit. It's like, oh, MPs, by the way, they go through the shittiest part of town every single day, and we need you in there talking to, you know, a completely different mission. You know, we're going to go talk to the Iraqi police every day. 
and and blend in. So how many different jobs did you have? How many different units do you think you served? I really can't count them. <laughs> That's the internet for the yeah. PTSD. Is like he just you just never quit. You just yeah. keep going. You just yeah, because you did it for three years. Straight. I did it for three years and yeah. all the units, Marines units, you know, all of that. That's equivalent to what we can remember from World War One, World War Two, yeah. where there weren't one year deployments like in Vietnam or these seven month deployments in Iraq or Afghanistan. He's off. He's gone from his family. And he's basically persona grata in his hometown, right. Baghdad. He's gone for three years, day in and day. He's in war for three years straight. And they did give these guys leave. They could go back and do things. But a lot of the Terps didn't even take leave because if they went home, they'd get found out, and it was a greater risk for them for murder or intimidation and, and threats. So they just kind of sucked it up and, and, and fought day in and day out. It's just remarkable it to, is. Th- to think about it. So you go on Friday, payday. Whoop, whoop. You're not going to go to the uh, the titty club. So are they giving you cash? Okay, and and uh, let's ask Scott, how many ATMs? There's a guy who went all over town. How many ATMs did you see? Zero. So how are they paying you? Because you're not getting direct deposit to your you know Iraqi bank cash. account. Cash. Okay. Cold, so now, hard, Iraqi Now you got $1,100 in your pocket. And you're going to keep some for walking around money, buying some falafel and everything. But what do you do with all that money? Yeah, do they pay in Iraqi or U.S. dollars? No, they pay in U.S. dollars. Okay. Speaking of that much cash and forward, uh, I remember one time we were in Haditha. I think it was December in the desert. We were in a little base outside Haditha in the desert, and we were doing operations in the city itself. So me and Ford, we were in a little tent December in the desert. You can imagine how cold it so was. So cold. It's extremely cold. We didn't really have enough clothes. It was so <laughs> cold. So Ford, my, my best friend, he was- involved two dudes in a sleeping bag? <laughs> well, <laughs> that, <it's, laughs> that's how you get warm. <laughs> yeah. That's how you get warm. Everybody does it. So- for he like we we were we like we had in our pockets in our wallet like I think three four months more than three months twelve five months in our salary cash in our pockets and for he got to the point where he said I'm done I'm gonna quit I can't take this life anymore I can't live this life I'm putting my life in like in in danger and I'm if I don't die in action I'm gonna die freezing here. <laughs> and then, like, uh, and you're walking around with like six thousand bucks cash in your pocket. Okay, yeah, we were a literally couple of teenage retards <laughs> walking around well, in we, Iraq with all this cash. We were an American base with the U.S. <laughs> Marines. We were with the U.S. Did you spend any of it? We didn't spend what you like all yeah. the PX. Like that's the only place that you yeah, spend I it. All the Funyuns, like these Funyuns. <laughs> holy fuck! I can't get enough of them. <laughs> no, Amari's are the best. Jesus Christ. Free MREs. Free so, MREs. So for he was Were you an Apple stealer from the Chow Hall? You'd be like, take one of these apples, a couple of these muffins. I was a good pit stealer. Rip it yeah. stealer. Rip, Rip it. it is the Get lowest it. lowest bitter equivalent of Red Bull for listeners. Um actually the reason they came in those small little cans was for shipping. Oh yeah, is that why? Yeah, that's why. A little trivia. They look like uh, six ounce cans. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so you guys got a bunch of money. So we got a bunch of money and Ford Wells crying and he said like we're gonna quit i'm I'm gonna quit i can't stay here i want to go back to my family so what i did is i took the whole cash out of my pocket and i told him like look and then i really went through the money and i smelled it and i was like see that all you see all this cash what the hell your family gonna do with you if you don't have that cash so stay here work more do your job Make her make more money, and then you can help her family better. Okay, so it's it's important to tell too. Ford, high school best friends, they grew up, hang out, played soccer together, whatever teenagers do. <laughs> then they go through all of this together. He Ford ropes Sam in. Sam talks him into staying in. Sam is the great American success story, but so is Ford because he's also he's a U.S. citizen now, right? Yeah, yeah. He got his citizenship before. Uh, Sam did and guess what he does now he's a level three interpreter for a high government agency so he went back as an interpreter after coming to America goes to work for our government his government 
and now he's a senior level interpreter again. What Still that means doing it as a level three somewhere it means top secret SCI it means he's got a clearance and he's processing whatever comes across his desk. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, he's got benefits. So I don't know if that makes him the smarter of the two or the bigger it's Bruce taker in the end, but somebody decided to take <laughs> education and yeah. learn about computers, and somebody decided to make more money. I want to add, so we got like we've almost been at this for an hour, but I want to ask you a different question. You've been here, you understand America pretty well and everything, and you see all of this stuff with immigration and folks just walking across the border. Given what you went through to have the right to even apply, and I don't know if you had to, I know my buddy Spider didn't get to come over, and he had to send, give someone a bribe just to apply, you know, in Iraq to come over here. What do you think about that, about folks that? try to come I mean they're just as desperate but what do you think what are your thoughts well it's a pretty complicated topic but you know for myself I be and other interpreters we literally risked our lives we put our lives on the line we proved our loyalty to our country America and we went through the whole bag on process took years and we've been here, we l I lived here six years, and I applied for the citizenship, and I got it. And the same day that I left Iraq, June 5, 2012, June 5, 2018, same day, same month, I got my U.S. citizenship. So the same day that I lost country, again, a, a new country. So about people who, like, doesn't matter what way, you know, they crossed the border, they came through a boat or whatever. You know, I think America was built 100 years ago through that. But different time, different place, it's, it's different now. I think, yeah, America, it has, it's, it's a land of opportunities. Everybody should have an opportunity. But there is there should be a process to follow. It, not anybody... They were like, okay, I want to live in America. It, it shouldn't be that way. You have to kind of, it, it's it's not just uh, take, it's give and take. What are we willing to give here in order for you to take from here, from this country? So it's not only take, it's a give and take. So I, I don't, the way that people come here, I I don't agree on most of it, but I think the way that our government now deals with it, I don't think it's the right way at the same time. That's fair. Yeah. 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 So let's do uh, let's do a comparison. Kyle. Let's do rapid fire real quick. So okay. <laughs> biggest thing you miss about Iraq? Food. Food. I was going to say Samoon or Next or question. So Pete. Yes. Next question. Oh, um... Shot. I thought you were going to ask all the questions. I, yeah. Okay. The the thing you miss the most that's not food, like cultural things, TV, like watching uh, Buka or whatever it is. <laughs> the most thing about that I miss about Iraq is the social hangout. Yeah, that's the most thing that I miss about. What do you America. love most about America now that you're here? The most thing I love about America is the law. The law. Yeah. Not getting shot at every day. That's well, nice. That's a bonus. <laughs> when the when the Arab Cup is going on and Iraq has been eliminated, what country do you want to win? Iraq. Oh, Iraq. Lim yeah, eliminated. they're eliminated. Okay. Yeah. I would go with Egypt. Okay. Hottest women: Iraq, American. <laughs> oh God. Well, I'm American now, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a trick question. <laughs> If we wanted to defeat Al Qaeda and we just installed a bunch of Hooters in like Karada and Baghdad and everything else, would that work? Definitely. I told you. <laughs> Definitely. Hooters, <laughs> Baghdad. Yeah. yeah, Hooters in Baghdad. <laughs> Trust me. All terrorists. So all CEO insane. of Hooters, if you're listening, you're missing out on a, a huge opportunity to over win there. The war. To win the war. You want to be the guy that single handedly wins the war. And then if you're one of those guys that has one of those uh, small ATMs, Scott would suggest as well. Having some ATMs. ATMs, around. I'm telling you, man, I've said this on a couple of shows, I think, already the DMV. As yeah. much as Americans say the DMV, no one has a license or any ID over there. It's just yeah, you know, free for all. You don't know who anyone is. Yeah. It's like a bad library card at their elimination totally. machine. I've seen hall passes in high schools that look better, but uh, yeah. So you've gone, one of the things that 
Native born Americans lose sight of is just how great this country is. And this isn't like, you know, raw, raw America thing, but we're awfully hard on ourselves. You know, we Sam's think- super raw, raw American. He picks he- up flags on the side of the road. He'll drive back up his car. He sees an American flag and he'll get out of his car and pick it up. That's how dear he holds our colors. See, and this when, is when eight thousand yeah. Americans have driven past it. Sam goes, Ur, he's Stop. done it like four or yeah. five times. He posts it on Facebook. I love it. Love there, it. There's another story I haven't. <clears throat> I haven't really shared. At at a job that I had in the past six years, I'm not going to name the company or one. The company had a Canadian flag hanging on the wall in the office. Mm-hmm. And so it was an American company, and it was here in America. So I talked to my manager. I was like, hey, I don't really know why you guys have their Canadian flag here. I know they are one of our clients, but I think it would be appropriate if you hang American flag next to it, actually above it, because we're Americans, and it's an American company, and we are in America. And nobody, what, what, what was most shocking for me was none of my coworkers actually displayed any concern about not having an American flag. And then when I talked to my manager, I was like, I have nothing against Canada, but I think we are as Americans, as people who live here. And like you mentioned, the people who are trying to move here and the risks that they take and everybody not like uh, me and the other immigrants who tried to come here, we pay a lot to get here. We prove a lot to get here. So it's, it's not cheap at all. And then I see Canadian flag hanging above my head in America. I, I didn't accept that. So the manager, they took it down. They took the Canadian flag. Yeah. yeah. And then if you're going to do it to be like cool and even and Steven or thing, it goes American flag. Oh, then Canadian flag. Then the fucking queen. And then the Canadian flag. Because let's be honest, they're subservient to a sovereign. <laughs> <laughs>